So I'm a community organizer. I've been organizing communities all my life. And I've learned something in this community organizing that I think is important for creating the futures that we want to create. In fact, I've, I've come to believe that I have found a superpower that we can all tap into. <laughs> but before I tell you about it, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. So um, I'm going to start with my mom. This is my mom. She was born in Los Angeles in rough circumstances. She put herself as an independent working class woman through college in the 1950s. By the way, that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Her first job, she was a teacher at Blythe Street Elementary in the San Fernando Valley. That's her in the back with the big hair in the middle. You might see I didn't get the big hair, Jean. <laughs> the first thing she did as a new teacher at Blythe Street Elementary, she got all the teachers and the administrators together. She took them off site to set up a kind of support group. She did that that first year, 1961. She did it every single year for 50 years thereafter. They were, none of them were still working at Blythe Street Elementary. In fact, they lived all over the country. They flew in to Los Angeles for this annual meetup that my mom created. This is just one of the many communities that my mom built. When I was 10, my father left and my mom had a nervous breakdown. Inspired by my mom's Blythe spirits, that's what she called that group. Me and a bunch of other kids in the neighborhood, together we created a kind of support group for each other. We were all going through a hard time. When I got to college, I became co-chair of the Anti-Apartheid Coalition. It's the 1980s. And together, our small group, we ended up getting 20% of the student body as members of our Anti-Apartheid Coalition. Once I had achieved that, I reached out to the heads of the other progressive groups and I said, we should meet together. The gay and lesbian group, the women's group, the Chicano group, the African American student group, let's meet together. At first they were like, well, we're so different from each other. In fact, we're all about our differences. I said, yes, we are different from each other. I don't mean to pretend we're the same. But we have some shared interests and some similarities. We could learn something from each other. We could ask each other for help. They were initially a little resistant, but they came along. And it was a transformative experience for all of us. After college, I moved here to New York. This is my 25th year in the Big Apple. Glad to be here. I came to work for an inner city youth program. It's a great program. It relates to kids as capable, more capable than they, they, they themselves think they are. Okay. A few years later, it's a long story for a different talk. I actually ended up at Harvard Business School. My second year, I became co-chair of the Internet Conference, Cyberposium. I was an early adopter of the Internet pre-web uh, and worked in various Internet businesses. But I said to my fellow students, we're going to run this in a different way. We're going to invite students at 50 other MBA programs around the world to co-create this conference with us. Not just come as attendees, but co-create this. We're going to have an experience of what it means to build real trust. And they're like, really? <laughs> we don't want to do that. I said, I'm the co-chair. We're doing it. <laughs> they said, all right. They called the other schools. They're like, no, we don't want to do that. You're trying to trick us. You're hired. You really anyway, long story, they eventually did. A lot of relationships got built. I'll never forget the night before the event. The Harvard students, you see a picture here, are putting all the stuffs in, you know, doing everything you do before the conference. And in walk the students from Vanderbilt, whom we had never met in person but had been collaborating with online for six months. The genuine affection and tears from the Harvard students at that moment to meet these people they'd been collaborating with. That for me was everything. I, the conference was kind of an afterthought. That was what I wanted to create. 
After business school, I worked with some startups. I came back to New York. I eventually became CEO of one of these startups, Creative Good. I ran that company for 15 years. Great company, thrilled the experience I had there. In 2002, after the dot-com bomb went off, there were only a few of us left. And you were like, what just happened? And I looked around and I said, we have to create some community here. We have to find a way to support each other. So I said to Marissa Meyer and others, some of whom are in the audience today, let's create some councils where different executives from different companies in different industries, yes, we're all different, but can come together and ask each other for help. You know, people don't go walking around every day thinking, I need to ask for help. It's not exactly how we're trained, but it turns out it's transformative. This is what I still do today in my day job. I run a company called Collaborative Gain, where I bring executives in the digital world together, product managers on product councils, marketers on marketing councils, general managers, CEOs, and I tell them you're here to ask each other for help. And actually, I want you to ask for help on the hard stuff. Take risks and be vulnerable. It's hard to do. In 2005, many of my friends were starting the next wave of internet companies, or had already done so. You know, the names we all know today. I stepped back and I said, I want to look at the bigger picture here. I want to think about what we've all just gone through, what we've learned, what's going on in the world. I ended up reading a lot of Charlie Munger. He's Warren Buffett's business partner. I really recommend reading him, by the way. He talks a lot about building lattice works of frameworks, being able to see from a variety of perspectives. I ended up creating a nonprofit called The Reading Odyssey, focused on helping adults reignite their lifelong learning through these reading communities. Scholars uh, participate, we collaborate together. I've had hundreds of thousands of participants all over the world. The all the programs are free. And I say, Read these books that you think are hard to read, like Darwin's Origin of Species, which, by the way, is not that hard to read. It's a terrific book. I recommend it. But do it with other people and build some community in the process. Then a few years later, I started something called Slow Art Day. I discovered that me and many people don't know how to look at art and, frankly, don't feel welcome in many art museums. I walked into the Jewish Museum in New York. I sat down for an hour, and I looked at Hans Hoffmann's Fantasia for one hour. It blew my mind. I said, this is the experience other people need to have. So I did what I usually do. I created a global community. This year, fifth year, 240 museums, galleries, and prisons participated in Slow Art Day. We haven't invested a dollar in this. It's all completely open global event. And we've done it by virtue of this superpower I referred to earlier that we have tapped into. All right. After Slow Art Day became successful, I kind of stood back and said, what's going on here? Slow Art Day, Reading Odyssey, the councils, the cyberposium thing, anti-apartheid. So these things are growing beyond my expectations. What, what accounts for this? I ended up reading, I had known about Daniel Kahneman's work. I ended up reading, again, really looking closely at Thinking Fast and Slow, which I recommend. It's a terrific book. It's a gift he's given, I think, at the end of his career. He talks about the biases and cognitive traps that prevent us from doing the things that we want to do and creating the futures that we want to create. He talks about Kahneman, things like confirmation bias, right? Where you only see what you already believe. That's a problem if you want to create the future, by the way. The unexpected is completely outside of your horizon. Now, at the end of Kahneman's book, he says to me the most remarkable thing and it doesn't get talked about enough. He says, despite 40 years of research, co-inventing behavioral economics, winning the Nobel Prize, changing the world of economics and psychology, despite all of that, I, myself, Daniel Kahneman, I cannot prevent myself from making all of these same mistakes. I have no idea when I'm doing them. But if Hal here is sitting with me, and he's a friend of mine, and we have some trust, he'll notice right away. And in fact, he can tell me. And I can say the same to him. And whoa. Kahneman, even Kahneman can't create the future alone. Then I stumbled onto Stumbling on Happiness by Daniel Gilbert. Great book. Really relevant to our TEDx. 
He says, we spend 12 minutes of every waking hour thinking about the future. 12 minutes. But we're really bad at it. We shoot ourselves in the foot. Now, he says there is a solution to this. Building on Kahneman and extending Kahneman, there's a solution. What is that solution, Gilbert? The solution is to reach out to our peers and ask for help. What? I couldn't believe it. Here it is. I was so excited. And then I read the next paragraph. He says, but you're not going to do that. He says, I've done all the research, and people actually won't reach out and ask for help because they don't want to believe that they have similarities with others. In fact, if you tell someone, hey, you're similar, their first response is to have a bad mood. They go sour. So I'm reading that. What do we? Now, this is where the superpower comes in. So it turns out that collaboration is hard. C collaboration of the kind where you really open up, you show your vulnerability, you ask for help, is really hard to do. So how to, but I think it is fundamental, and it is why these things I've done with almost no investment dollars have exploded. But how do we do it? Because it's hard, and we don't want to do it, and we're going to get in a bad mood. So. You're not going to like this. I didn't like it. I have to give credit to my therapist of 30 years. <laughs> she really helped me understand this. Here's the superpower. If you're willing to embrace that you're ordinary, that you're marvelously ordinary, Yes, you are unique and have some different skills, but you are ordinary. You put your pants on one leg at a time. You have far more in common than you do not have in common, even with people who look radically different than you are. I have a rule of thumb in the councils. When a member comes to me and says, oh, I'm glad I'm in this council, but I don't have anything in common with Jeff over there. I'm not going to learn anything from him. Six months from now, you're going to come back to me and say, oh my God, Jeff has changed my life. We are ordinary. This is what I have learned to embrace. And because of that, I reach out and I ask for help in sincere and meaningful ways. And people absolutely love it. There is so little of this in the world. And it is free. It is free. And you can expand your businesses and create a better future. I have come to believe that we can solve the major crises that are facing us today if we make this one seemingly small change in how we w relate to the world. All right. So now I want to ask you for help. And I want to give you three assignments. One, after today's session, I want you to ask someone for help. It can be, like, let's make it small. Like, maybe you didn't understand something someone said on stage. Or, or you didn't agree, or you had a different point of view. Ask them to explain it. How did you see it? Help me understand what you got out of this talk. Let's, we'll take a baby step. Second thing is, I am starting a movement. I'm looking for the humble leaders out there. If you're excellent and humble, I want to meet you. I want to find out who you are, how you got there. And what more support do you need? On my website, collaborativegain.com, I have a link for a survey. I would love for you to take the survey. I ask you only one question. Who have you worked with in your career? Who would you say is excellent and humble that you've had some direct relationship with? G give me their name. Just tell me who they are. And then we're going to go find out how they got to be that way and how we create more of them. The final thing I say is participate in one of these free collaborative communities that I've built. Come to Slow Art Day next year, April 11th, and look slowly at art and discover what that experience is like. It is amazing. Or join us reading Herodotus or Lucretius this fall in a phone-based reading group with scholars and other readers collaborating and be a part of this collaborative community and discover you're capable of reading these books and that they will change how you see things. 
and help you create a better future. If you remember one thing from my talk today, this is what I want it to be. If you embrace your ordinary, you can do something extraordinary. Thank you.